talk about on Pentecost? Well, the Holy Spirit, of course. But how? I wanted this morning just to give you a few reasons why I love God, the Holy Spirit. The first reason that I love God, the Holy Spirit, is this. He, she, I think I'm going to refer to she. Did you know for the first four centuries of the church, because of all the feminine attributes of the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was largely thought to be female? We'll revert to that. She reveals the truth of Jesus. That's the role of the Holy Spirit in much of the New Testament. Do you remember those Jesus blocks? Those. Anybody got one? Stephanie, bless you. You're supposed to look at them. They say Jesus, I've let the cat out of the bag. But because it's in relief, sometimes you can look at those for ages. And the first time I ever came across one was in my very first appointment in West Yorkshire in the home of Connie, who now must be 140, so she's probably gone to be with the Lord. And she had one on the, on, on, on the uh, mantelpiece, and I was looking at it, and she knew I couldn't understand what it was. So she said, I'll make a cup of tea, and you see if you've got it when I come back. And she knew I hadn't got it when she came back, because I'd put it on its end. But when you see that it says Jesus, you see it. It's unmistakable. And thereafter, you see it straight away. Don, can you see it? You're looking a bit, no, you've not seen it yet. Keep looking, yeah, keep looking at it. Look at the dark bits, not the light. Oh. (laughs) She knew I hadn't got it, but when you do get it, You can just see it. Now, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. The Holy Spirit helps us get it about the truth and the nature of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the revealer of truth in him and the glorifier of him. Have you found it now? I love the way that Paul tells his testimony three times in the Acts of the Apostles. Whenever Luke gives you three three accounts of something, he's basically saying this is really, really important. And three times in the Acts of the Apostles, Paul gives his testimony. And each time he gives it, 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 it gets a bit longer. And when you think about it, that's absolutely right because he's got a bit more to say. And near the end of his life, the Apostle Paul writes a book like Philippians. And at the end of the chapter of Philippians, he writes this, I want to know Christ. And you read that and you say, whoa, just a minute, Paul. You are the apostle to the Gentiles. You saw Jesus come in blinding light, your own Pentecost on the road How? And there's 40 years gone by and you're telling us you want to know Christ. We thought you did. And Paul would say to us, yes, I know Christ. And the more I know him, the more I know I need to know him. Now that's the work of the Spirit. The Spirit reveals the truth and the depths of truth about the Son of God. C.H. Spurgeon, that great Baptist preacher of the late 19th, early, very early 20th century, Elephant and Castle, Metropolitan Pulpit. He wrote many things, but I love one of the things he wrote about the Holy Spirit. He, he said this, Behold, I saw a dove come from heaven, and it alighted on my shoulder. I turned to look at the dove and it flew away. Why did the dove fly away? Because when you look at the dove, you take your eyes from where they're meant to be, which is on Christ. 
You see, the Holy Spirit reveals the truth and glorifies Jesus. And once we become too interested in the Holy Spirit himself, herself, in terms of the gifts of the Spirit, how in my early youth fellowship, everybody found a way in the peck line as to whether or not they could speak in tongues. The more that you become concentrated on those kind of things for their own sake, or to seek to be super spiritual because you, can, you possess this gift of the Spirit rather than this one, or none at all, or three instead of none at all, then in a sense, the dove flies away. The Spirit says, in effect, I'm not here to be the focus of attention. I'm here to enable you to understand the one who is worthy of all attention. And that's Christ. So the Holy Spirit reveals who Jesus is. Will we, this Pentecost, continue to let the Holy Spirit come to us and work in us? to be the revealer and the glorifier of Christ. Christ in us, says Paul, the hope of glory. The second thing I love about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is the one who comes alongside us. Who comes alongside us. It's one of those really, really difficult words to translate into English. If you grab all the versions of the Bible, and we had one of them this morning, and look at how the Holy Spirit's function is described, you'll come up with about five words. He is, she is, the comforter. They, he, she is the counselor. He, she is better, actually, in the Greek, helper. But the reason that we have difficulty in English with a Greek and Latin word, paraclete, is because it doesn't actually translate function, helper, counselor. It translates as position. Para, to be next to. Cletus, at the call of. You call for one who is next to you. And in a sense, all the other things about what the Holy Spirit does in terms of comforting or challenging or helping all come because the Holy Spirit is there alongside. It was Jesus, remember, who said that when the Holy Spirit comes, I will send another helper and the Spirit will be with you forever. This is the one who walks through your life with you. The Greek almost means simply at hand, there. <laughs> I love the way that the Spirit of God has been my companion down many years. In times of greatest joy and I think I remember most the times of deepest sorrow. In the dark nights of the soul, in times of biggest heartache or trials or uncertainties. I remember a time when I went to Hull of all places to speak at a circuit convention. Like Mr. Wesley, I went unwillingly. There I was driving along the M62 on a wet Saturday afternoon, listening to the radio and Leeds United were losing again, wondering whatever had possessed me months before to say yes to the invitation to go and speak at their rally. But also being right in the middle of tests for a then undiagnosed genetic illness. So I knew something was wrong with me, but I didn't know what. And I knew that later that week, I was going to have several biopsies, and I didn't know what they were going to find. And it was while I was speaking that night, wishing I wasn't, about the Holy Spirit, that I heard myself say something 
out loud. And in the split second that I was about to say it out loud, the Spirit said to me very clearly, and that doesn't happen to me very often, now listen to this, Martin, because I'm going to tell you the truth. And I heard myself say this, it doesn't matter whether or not my ministry as a Methodist minister will be sustained very long. It doesn't matter whether or not I'm able to preach for the ensuing years and decades. Because God doesn't value me for what I do. God values me for who I am. And through the Spirit, he says, astonishingly, and I love you. You're my loved child. Now, that's the work of the Spirit. You, you have your own stories. Stories of how strength was given, how you made it through. Even now in this room, there's got to be those of us who are in the middle of struggles. Two steps forward, one step backwards. And the struggle is a lifelong part of our life. But you just know that the helper is helping. And that's the work of the Spirit. The Spirit of God who comes alongside. And although we're not always as aware of the Spirit's presence with us, sometimes as opposed to others, is with us forever and for our good because that's the Spirit's loving role to us. So whatever else we affirm this Pentecost, affirm that, speak it to your own heart, come Holy Spirit, come alongside and walk with me. The third thing I love about the Holy Spirit is that the Spirit of God is a Holy Spirit. Spirit. And I think I always sort of bamboozle them because they, they come along and I say, oh, I always feel under conviction. I'd say, great. No, 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 you don't understand. It's bad. No, it isn't. If you're under conviction, it's because God's saying something to you that God wants to put right in your life. That's good. Now, I don't know whether or not all of them got it. But I do want you to notice this, because I love this too about the Holy Spirit. That whenever we're under conviction, whenever we're conscience stricken, whenever we're being challenged in our lives in the di direction of holiness, it indicates that God actually has not given up on us. Now just think about that for a moment. If God had just given up on us, we'd just be left alone on our own. God would say, I've had it with you, Atkins. You never listen. You want time after time after time after time of new starts. You never make any difference. You're useless. And I'm now just going to ignore you. God doesn't do that with us. God doesn't do that with any of us. And that's actually amazing. So the next time that you're convicted or guilt-ridden or challenged, don't say to yourself miserably, oh, I'm under conviction. Say to yourself, God's not given up on me. And God's giving me the resources to continue along the way. Come, Holy Spirit. Do you remember that great passage from the Gospels from Luke 11? If your child asks for a fish, do you give him a snake? If your child asks for an egg, do you give her a scorpion? If you then 
Evil and fallen know how to give good gifts to your children. Listen to this. How much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? One of the most important revelations of my Christian life is that for so long I thought and prayed and acted as if receiving the Spirit was somehow down to me. When all the time God was more ready to give the Holy Spirit than I was to receive her. Whenever we say to God in whatever condition we are, come Holy Spirit, she comes to us. I've noticed down the years, I'm moving to a close, that there are two essential movements occurring when the Holy Spirit comes to us, the effect. The first is infilling, the infilling of the Spirit. Very Wesleyan phrase, John Wesley used it more commonly than any other about the experience of the Spirit. And most of the things that I've told you this morning that personally I love about God, the Holy Spirit, are all examples, if you like, of infilling. But the other movement, the second movement of the Holy Spirit, is outpouring. And infilling and outpouring are intrinsically linked together. That is, the infilling is related to the outpouring. You see, we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not given the resources or the strength or the boldness or the peace for our own sake that we can sit down at the end of a week and every year and say, oh, do you know, we are blessed. The Holy Spirit is... A missionary, outward urge spirit. Which is the last thing that I love about the Holy Spirit that I'll talk about today. And that is that the Holy Spirit is constantly leading the disciples of Jesus Christ into engagement with God's world and God's people. You see that more clearly than any other motif of the Holy Spirit in the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. On the day of Pentecost, and it drives me nuts, there's not much drives me nuts, but it drives me nuts when people say that the day of Pentecost is the birthday of the church. Nonsense. It's the birthday of the Christian mission. It's the birthday of God saying, now come with me. That's very different. The coming of the Spirit in Acts 2 is essentially the story of how frightened people locked in a room saying their prayers, obediently waiting for this Spirit, not quite knowing what's going to happen, as Kina said so adequately for us earlier on. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Tongues of fire, a light, and the nearness of God is overwhelming. And after all the trauma of the arrest and the beating and the crucifixion of Jesus and the mind-blowingness of the resurrection and the bittersweet nature of the ascension. Here is the Holy Spirit falling upon them. It must have been like lying in a bath, a beautiful bath of hot water with expensive bubbles in it and relaxing and saying to yourself, do you know, I could stay here forever. And do you know what the first action of the Holy Spirit is? She walks in, pulls the bath plug out and says, come with me. I haven't arrived, she says, just to bless you. I've got a job for you to do. You've got to be a blessing to someone else. 
And the first movement of the Spirit through the apostles is outside the door of their early sanctuary. Onto the streets of Jerusalem, into the crowd to preach and witness and heal and disperse and serve and bless. I'm a Wesleyan. Sorry, I can't do anything about it. And I think that John Wesley's understanding of the Holy Spirit is one of the great gifts given to the one holy Catholic Church. Because John Wesley talked repeatedly about the prevenient work of the Holy Spirit. The going before God. The God who is always there before you get there. The God who's already started a work of grace before you think you've got to start something. A big Holy Spirit who within the Trinity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit loves the world so much that he gave his self in his Son and now comes on the day of Pentecost and gives his self again as Holy Spirit. So that through the Spirit, God continues to love the world and redeem it through Christ. The brooding, wooing, convicting, converting work of the Spirit is everywhere. The Spirit isn't the domesticated pet of the Christian church. The Spirit is the Spirit of all life. So the real test of Pentecost is not how much of the Holy Spirit we say we have. Listen to this. It is not how much of the Holy Spirit we say we have, but how much the Holy Spirit has us as individuals and as a congregation of Christ's people in London in 2019. All of us, body, mind and spirit, placed into the hands of a Holy Spirit who keeps pulling the plug out. Anybody who's watched The Apprentice will know the famous words of Alan Sugar. It is, they are. Try again. It is, they are. You're fired. I'm disgusted that so many of you watch it. It means, doesn't it, on that program that you've been tried and tested, but ultimately you're rejected, ditched, abandoned, and you've failed. That's not the way of God's Holy Spirit. But there is one similarity, and I leave you with this. The Spirit does say to each and every one of us, you're fired. Fired through, burned through, with my love, God's love and power. And the Holy Spirit says to us on the day of Pentecost, I will continue to reveal the Lord Jesus to you. I will continue to be alongside you through everything and forever. I will enable that you know more and more of him if you want that. I will continue to convict you and lead you towards holiness because I love you. But I will fill you too in order that you be people of outpouring in the world. And therefore every church becomes a gift to every soul for whom Jesus Christ died. So don't be surprised. When you say, come Holy Spirit. And the Spirit comes. And then the first thing that the Spirit says is, come with me. And at that point, we will come to understand a little bit more of what Pentecost is about. Amen.